This episode of Disease Du Jour is brought to you by equinevetedu.com, a free online educational platform for veterinarians, vet students, and vet techs, brought to you by Equa Management. Visit equinevetedu.com for free race-approved CE and courses on topics of current interest. Welcome to Echo Management's podcast, Disease Du Jour, where each podcast will delve into the research and current best practices for a variety of equine health problems with industry experts. I'm your host, Kimberly Brown, publisher of Equa Management. Today's guests are Drs. Ernie Bailey and Samantha Brooks. Ernie Bailey, a PhD, is a professor at the University of Kentucky's Glock Equine Research Center. His key areas of interest are immunogenetics and genomics. He is interested in the genetic influences on the innate and adaptive immune systems that protect the horse from infectious diseases. Other interests include the development of the genetic map for horses and investigation of genes involved in the health of the horse, such as contracted tendons, extreme lordosis, and dwarfism. Dr. Bailey received his Bachelor's of Science in Genetics from the University of California, Davis in 1973 then received his Master's in Comparative Pathology from UC Davis in 1975 and his Ph.D. in Genetics in 1980 from UC Davis. Samantha Brooks, Ph.D., is an Associate Professor of Equine Physiology at the University of Florida's Department of Animal Sciences. Following her B.S. degree in Agricultural Biotechnology at the University of Kentucky, Dr. Brooks earned her Ph.D. in Equine Genetics under the mentorship of Dr. Bailey. She then was awarded the Paul Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship to study the expression of inflammatory genes in horses affected with laminitis. In 2009, Dr. Brooks became an assistant professor at Cornell University Department of Animal Science. In 2014, she moved to the University of Florida and has moved up through the ranks to associate professor. Her research program explores a variety of topics relevant to horse health, ranging from gene expression studies to mapping of genetic disorders of the horse. Previously, her research group discovered genetic mutations and markers for coat colors, height, sarcoid tumors, and two neurological conditions. Ongoing work targets variation in gait, susceptibility to infectious disease, metabolic syndrome, and skeletal defects using genome-wide association, genome resequencing, and transcriptomics. Thank you, Drs. Bailey and Brooks, for joining us today on Disease Du Jour to talk about Genes are management tools for veterinarians. So first, let's start with Dr. Bailey. How does genetics touch the equine veterinarian on a day-to-day basis? I, I think that uh, um, in the past, genetics was something that, that happened after the fact, that uh, it wasn't really a management tool. It was a problem that came up. It was God had interacted. There was a black box. Um, we had a large international collaboration that, that that mapped the genome, developed sequence, made absolutely amazing tools, and we were able to go through and identify um, genetic markers for a number of traits. Uh, I think initially we used them to look at coat colors because the genetics were well established. And then people were looking at diseases, health conditions, um, some complex traits. It, it's caused an evolution in, in genetics and, it's, and the usefulness of it for the veterinarian. And, and part of it is that the veterinarian can use them as to anticipate problems that are coming up. Um, we've seen genetic research evolve from molecular geneticists picking targets and henpecking veterinarians in clinics to, to get us cases to where veterinarians are out in the field collecting samples and seeking uh, geneticists and collaborating with them to identify genetic basis for different diseases. It's hard to keep up with how many things are out there that, that, that people are developing tests that are useful to anticipate problems. And Dr. Brooks, how do you think that genetics touches equine veterinarians on a day-to-day basis today? Well, many of the challenges we face in keeping our horses healthy uh, are a result of the evolution of the horse to be enormously successful in a diverse set of environments, none of which included the stable or the paddock, right? So they were, they're one of the most successful species on the face of the earth, or family of species, branch of, a, of the tree of life. And over the past 55 million years, um, their, their physiology was adapted to, to live out in the wild and not under uh, a human 
husbandry situation. And so we get into trouble sometimes when, now that we have our optimized diets and we need to keep them on smaller acreage and in that our management practices have left them a little maladapted. Uh, for example, they tend to be a bit prone to obesity because we can give them excellent diets, uh, which creates issues with insulin resistance and laminitis today. But a thousand years or even 500 or 100 years ago, uh, a horse who was prone to obesity would have been an easy keeper, would have been more likely to survive when worked on a daily basis or when surviving out on the prairie. And so we have to remember that the horse is a product of their very successful genetics. It's just that their genetics were uh, best adapted to a situation different from what they're in today. And then the veterinarian has a variety of things in their toolbox that they may not even know are there. So we have tests for genetic diseases that are commonplace in many breeds that can be used both diagnostically and prognostically. So veterinarians can, can uh, very quickly now get results from genetic tests that can answer diagnostic questions that may be puzzling them, and then to prescribe management changes or, or sometimes prescriptions and, and, and drug treatments that are best tailored to fit that particular horse and his genetic condition. And then I think veterinarians need to remember that they are, are the geneticists' front line. They are one of our most important partners in conducting research. And so if they're dealing with difficult cases or, or sometimes diseases that can be very complex, like uh, resistance or susceptibility to infectious disease, and that we now have tools in our toolbox in terms of genomics and functional genomics and, and studies of gene expression where we can work with our veterinarians and our veterinary clinicians to use our genetic tools to help to better understand those diseases from a physiological point of view so that we can design new treatments and, and, and new avenues uh, to help to improve the health of the horse that are specifically based on the, the disease process and we may never have thought of without sort of wiping the slate clean and using genetics or gene expression to, to better understand the disease process. So we, we kind of have three different fronts, the sort of the, the ancient history standpoint, the current stepping on the farm today, and then what we hope to do in the future to better understand disease. There's, if I could, there, there's an interesting change in genetics in, in the approach. Um, as, as scientists, we can get funds, or we hope that we can get funds. <laughs> we would like we, to get funds, yes. <laughs> But to study things like respiratory disease, laminitis, and so on. But other things, contracted tendons, uh, um, parrot mouth, any number of, of things don't really capture the attention of funding agencies. Foundations, if they're raising money, they're not going to get lots of donors for parrot mouth. But this is a problem for, for veterinarians. And the, um, the exciting thing about genetics now is that um, we can actually do a lot with a very small material. At one time, we needed to collect large families and lots of individuals. It was a major expense, a major matter of time. Um, now, with a few cases, we can actually do quite a, quite a bit. A lot of it is due to the fact that there's a huge amount of research on uh, genomics and genetics in humans and diseases, and a lot of these, the causes of a disease in one species will also cause a disease in another species. So rather than discover de novo, you know, what could, out of 20,000 genes in the genome, what could be causing it, the question suddenly becomes, this causes this disease in humans, does it cause it in horses? And we are able to basically go through, sequence a gene, test a couple of individuals, and find things out. It becomes a situation where the individual veterinarian who's working in an area and has a number, even a small number of cases, can collaborate with a molecular geneticist and figure some things out. We're seeing this regularly now. And again, this is this is where I think genetics comes into play on almost a daily basis with the animals that veterinarians are dealing with. Everything from colic to, to OCD to roaring, I mean, all of these have been researched. So let's delve into a couple of these. Let's talk about OCD for a minute, because we all know that it doesn't really matter the breed or discipline, that just about any horse can get an OCD, but there is a genetic research that has gone into this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, horse breeders have have suspected, their, their intuition for years has been that there's a heritable component, and studies 
uh, very early studies have definitely shown that there is a heritable component to that, differing by joint and by breed. And so it's not going to be one single region of the genome that causes all OCDs in, in every horse. And we think that it's likely that when we better understand the cause of the disease, the particular gene that is at play here, that we're going to see that it very logically fits into the hypothesis that we already knew as, as uh, managers and of horses, is that there's an interplay between the environment, especially when it comes to nutrition and with growth rate, right? So I think that uh, with further research, one of the really promising applications for some of these loci is that if we can identify young foals who are particularly at risk for OCD based on their genetics, based on their DNA, soon after they're born, then we have an opportunity where with very excellent skill and collaboration from our equine nutritionists, we could attempt to create diets tailored for each at-risk foal that would, through restricting their nutrition and their caloric intake, slow those growth rates to something that would manage the risk for OCD. I don't think we can entirely uh, dismiss it, and I, I think it's highly unlikely that we'll discover a genetic locus for which we might be able to put something in a syringe and inject it in a joint and it's going to stop all, all OCDs, right? You know, the, the hundreds of years of, of horseman's wisdom that says that nutrition plays a role I think is probably on the right path. But the key is you need to identify which horse is at risk because you're not going to convince uh, someone who's, who's growing young thoroughbred foals that we should slow them all down. No one likes to see a ribby foal if it's not for a reason. And, and we know that once a horse goes lame, that, you know, what veterinarians prescribe are slightly reduced exercise and to limit the injury to the joint and then to reduce their plane of nutrition. So I think that by using the markers, once we, they need a little more work. We need more funding and we need more research in this area so that we can really fine tune it, especially for groups like the thoroughbred. Most of the research has been done in warm bloods in Europe where they're able to get funding to do this type of thing. Um, but we can really perfect our markers so that we can identify those young foals who are at risk and maybe try to avoid those issues before we get to the point where we're cleaning out joints and have uh, problematic artifacts on radiographs that are going to start to impact the marketability and the future soundness of that horse. And some problems have been associated with certain breeds of horses. As you mentioned, it, it may not be across every breed, but I know, Dr. Bailey, you have uh, worked some with saddlebreds and some of the uh, markers for some of the problems with them. Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Well, there's, uh, I have a student who's working on um, swayback, extreme swayback in saddlebreds, and uh, that's interesting. There's the premise for the study, and the reason that the saddlebred people are interested in supporting the research is because some people find this extreme sway back unsightly. Most people probably do. Uh, it's unattractive to people that may want to come into the breed. But one of the questions that come up, comes up is why is it there? I mean, the way that genetics operates is that things are deleterious are gone. They're not there. And so we have to ask the question for many of these traits, is there something else going on? Um, we're curious to see if two copies of the gene causes the sway back under certain circumstances, does one copy of the gene cause the animals to be particularly good performers? And so at that point, if, if that were the case, then it isn't a matter that the breed would want to get rid of the gene, they might want to find out how to manage it. Um, if it's simply a Mendelian trait and homozygotes, two copies of the gene cause the disease, then it's a breeding thing, but it could be that there's other management um, aspects that could, could, could work there. Sam was talking about the OCD, and that's the same thing, is that uh, um, these genes are there. We don't quite know why. They may be selected for. If they were entirely deleterious, you would think that they would be gone after centuries of selection. So there may be some circumstances where they're good, and part of the challenge is to manage them. How do we feed them? How do we raise them uh, to work it out? What we don't want to do is to say, these are bad genes, this is a bad horse. That label, that's the idea that people have with genetics and that should go away. The genes are, are for management, not for labeling, not for making simple breeding select choices. And speaking of being able to use the genetics and knowledge of diseases and problems, um, I have a mare that's got PSSM. Uh, I have to manage her differently and sometimes I do real good at that and sometimes I don't. 
Um, but, you know, PSSM is, is one of those that we know there's been a test around for a while, but I'm not sure that maybe veterinarians are using it in all the, the times and locations that they should. Dr. Brooks, what do you say? Right. So PSSM, fortunately, is a disease that we, we know a, a, a fair amount of uh, good information about because the, the group who worked on that had the opportunity and had sufficient funding to go through and study the disease from a number of different aspects. Um, so PSSM itself is a, a condition that alters the way that horses store sugar in their muscles. And we think based on uh, the frequency of this disease in diverse breeds. So it's found very commonly at high frequencies, around 70%, I believe, in the Percheron, in heavy horses and working horses. And, and that, again, why would it be would a, something that we consider a disease be at such a high frequency? Well, the hypothesis that was put forward by the authors who originally studied that disease is that for a heavy horse, a horse who might be working at a plow and going through long cold winters, that being better able to store sugar in the muscles and less likely to use that energy unless it was really truly needed would be an, an, adapt, an adaptive advantage compared to a horse who tended to burn through energy um, any time it was called upon without the same um, sort of a, a faster rate of, of liberation of energy out of the muscles, right? So um, that provides a biological conundrum, so to speak, where this allele would have been valuable 100 or 1,000 years ago, but today on a high-carbohydrate diet, it becomes a liability. So animals who have this particular PSSM1 allele are prone to episodes of, of tying up, especially when they're on a high high-sugar diet. Now, Beyond that, so the, in the initial descriptions of, disease, of the disease, what they described was a very classic severe tying up episode with muscle cramps and signs of muscle pain and eventually um, the potentially life-threatening complications from the muscle damage. But as we've studied the disease further, we now know that PSSM interacts with other genetic alleles like uh, the MH, malignant hypothermia allele, and we think it alters the way they handle sugars and other ways that may uh, make them more predisposed to insulin resistance and potentially uh, has subclinical signs. So the same muscle pain that becomes very obvious and overt in a full-on tying up PSSM1 episode can operate at a lower level. And so we're now seeing uh, that the, the authors recently did a treadmill study where they could document this subclinical level of discomfort, which individual horse owners have described to me as a horse who's cold-backed and sometimes has a hard time taking a particular lead. Um, that, that sort of fits with what our researchers have seen in their treadmill studies where they can see very subtle changes in muscle enzymes and things like that in horses who are just heterozygous or aren't having an overt, you know, emergency episode of, of tying up. So our veterinarians might be called out to see a horse who is generally an easy keeper who might have had a couple mild b bouts of laminitis. Uh, maybe this is a dressage horse who doesn't like to take the right lead and tends to buck especially on a Monday after a long weekend, right? Um, and the veterinarian could think of a number of different explanations for this um, that would be very logical. However, all of those types of signs could then be tied back to something as simple as the presence of a PSSM1 allele, and those are very inexpensive to detect with modern uh, genetic technologies for doing genotyping. And the good news is, again, diseases are, are not always a death sentence. They're not something that we always should throw out wholesale. In this case, because there has been a very good body of work done on PSSM, we know that careful nutritional intervention can really make these horses much more comfortable and much uh, uh, more uh, less likely to end up in a catastrophic tying up episode and can certainly improve their their ability to perform um, thinking of that example of the horse who tends to be cold backed and so the vet a, a smart veterinarian who's up on their literature who might see this seemingly unrelated cluster of signs could become a real hero to the horse owner if they can suggest doing something as simple as genetic diagnostics because the cost is low and sometimes, sometimes 
the genetic diagnostics can point you in the direction of some treatments and management strategies that can make really um, significant and meaningful differences. Not always. Certainly sometimes when we study a genetic disease, we discover that actually there's absolutely nothing we can do to treat the disease. That, that was the case with lavender full, sadly, is that we were really hoping we could identify a biochemical pathway where we could intervene and potentially save the lives of those foals. That's a lethal recessive condition that causes epileptic type seizures. So it's not always a happy story. Sometimes it's a sad story. The only good news there is that the sad story is, you know, when those sick foals come into the hospital, we can now offer those tests on a fast turnaround in two or three days. And rather than keeping a foal in intensive care for two weeks at a cost of ten to $20,000, we can within two or three days give a horse owner peace of mind and say, yes, this is the disease. There will be no treatment and, and let them rest easy with the decision to euthanize because it wasn't strictly economic. Here we know it really was the biology of it. So it's, it's really that knowledge. You know, we always say knowledge is power. It's an overused kind of idiom, but um, it really is the truth when it comes to genetics. Both sometimes we get an unexpected happy ending when we can treat something quickly, and occasionally we get an unexpected unhappy ending, but at least we have some level of certainty and, and a better understanding of the situation. And, you know, when we were talking about some of the things that veterinarians face, OCD is one that, you know, has been around for a while. It's in multiple breeds and disciplines. Um, and we know a lot more about OCD than I think is, is thought of on a day-to-day -day basis when you're out dealing with sport horses of any breed or discipline. So what, what do we know now about OCD that can help veterinarians, help owners manage those horses? Well, specifically with OCD, um, we certainly, we have indication that it does um, it, it is a heritable condition, and so it does travel in family lines, and that really supports the efforts of, of some of our warm blood registries and potentially of our sport horse registries to begin to think very seriously about keeping systematic records uh, when it comes to OCD. And so for the veterinarian, I think if you're working with a breeder with a producer of young horses, um, that producer is going to want to use the popular lines that, that will create a very marketable foal, but the veterinarian really um, often is the voice of wisdom in some of these situations and needs to say, you know, um, if this mare has had three foals and all three have had some severe hawk lesions, you really should think about going another direction with your breeding program because there are some, some heritable tendencies. And, um, breeders are reluctant to hear that type of information, but, but the person they're going to most frequently trust is going to be their veterinarian because that's the person who's on the ground with them day to day. And I think that uh, early research has kind of suggested, and I think that if we can get future studies funded to really follow this through, we have a, certainly have good potential to, to make some interventions to better manage the way these horses grow and try to avoid getting into uh, problems, right? Cartilage is a very fascinating tissue, but once it's damaged, it's very, very difficult to get that back to a functional level. Certainly for elite athletes, one might say it's nearly impossible. So it's best to avoid that um, from the beginning. Of course, the difficulty is, is that specifically in the sport horse market and in the race horse market, we've been selecting for bigger horses. Uh, for years. You know, the thoroughbred has changed from an animal that was essentially a large pony 150 to 200 years ago at just about 14 three hands uh, on average at around the time of creation of the Weatherby stud book to something that these days on average approaches about 16 hands. And so clearly through selective breeding, uh, we, are, we are pushing the, the thoroughbred and other sport horses to be taller and that is going to encourage them to, uh, to grow faster selection acts on the genes that will make them grow faster. So um, this is probably a condition that, that we have sort of um, encouraged <laughs> in, our, in our selective schemes. The difficulty there is that in the sport horse market and the thoroughbred market, the taller horse is worth more money. They, they, uh, studies show that they run faster, they earn more money on the track, and uh, certainly a jumper, breeder of jumpers and dressage horses is going to tell you that they're, they're likely, more likely to succeed in the ring. And so the chances that we could just discard those alleles are, are really slim. We, we really need to better understand the biology that's at play so that we can manage them and help to limit the risk but still get the benefit from the alleles that, that we have positively selected for already. And the solution isn't to go back to 14.3 hands? No. 
<laughs> it's to figure out how to accommodate the genetics to so that you have these larger, faster, more athletic horses that are successful. And when we talk about larger horses, one of the things that comes to mind having lived in Kentucky and worked in the thoroughbred industry so long is roaring. Because there has been the association study between the bigger horses, the longer necks, and roaring. So what do we know about that and what can veterinarians take home in any breed and discipline? Absolutely. So we were very fortunate to collaborate uh, with uh, Dorothy Ainsworth at Cornell and Ed Robinson, who is up in Michigan, now retired, to do a very large comprehensive study on the thoroughbred horse and roaring. Horseman's Wisdom for years has said that the taller horse was more likely to have a problem with their airway, airway with roaring, which is um, fundamentally we already knew that it was caused of loss of innervation to the larynx. So their, their larynx is no longer uh, receiving the signals to open and they're trying to gallop down the track with only being able to move 50% of the air through their airway or, or less sometimes compared to their um, competitors, which is a huge uh, disadvantage and very frustrating for folks on the track who've already worked hard to keep a horse sound only to have them not be able to move sufficient air. And the treatments we have for that condition are, are really not sufficient. So tie back surgery would sort of be the gold standard but that is not without risks and isn't always entirely successful. So in that study we looked at uh, over 400, I think nearly 500 thoroughbred horses. I'd have to go back and read my own paper, sadly I don't remember, but a very large cohort of thoroughbred horses and we were um, quite surprised to find that not only did our association with height prove true, but ultimately at the end of the day, it was the very same gene locus that conferred risk for roaring for IRLN and for height in the thoroughbred. So this one locus, it adds about three inches in height uh, from a, a horse who's homozygous wild type to one who's homozygous, this alternate or, or we hate to say mutant, but this new allele. Uh, variant. Variant. Thank you. Homozygous for this variant. And uh, about three inches in height and about 12-fold higher risk for RLN. That's an enormous risk. I had to go look it up last night. <laughs> um, that means that that one single gene test can be very indicative of the likelihood that a horse is going to end up having a bad airway. And so you could potentially test a bunch of yearlings and see right away that uh, this one is going to be 12 times more likely than the one that's standing next to in the paddock. We need to watch his airway and be careful. And then it raises the question. So this very same locus also is, appears in some of our statistics for OCD. And so we think it's, it's no doubt is, has some influence on growth, although we don't yet understand the connection with the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the larynx. So our hope is that um, we can better understand this disease. Now that we have a gene locus to, to track, because before there was, you know, RLN was a disease purely studied by the surgeon, because from a management standpoint, there was certainly no drug or, or, or growth or supplement or, or anything that we could add to the horse or change that was going to necessarily um, change the likelihood they would get to the disease. But, but now we have a new understanding, and we have several gene targets in that area that we might be able to go after. Um, and because this one locus it contributes to height, it may have some small statistical addition to the risk for OCD, and and it's going to give a very strong predilection for having a bad airway. It has a lot of potential, both for use for selection, maybe in a pre-purchase exam, and for use in management, because then we could identify an individual who's going to be at risk for multiple different changes. Some are good, like an increased height, a little bit longer leg on the track is going to be a good thing. Most people would agree they would like to see that, but then the risk of OCD and the risk for RLN are a bad thing. And so these horses, once we have them identified in your herd, you can start to manage them as the individuals that they are to, to try to um, get the most advantage out of that, that horse as you can. Let him achieve the positive parts of his potential as much as possible and manage his risk with, with skillful husbandry. And most, and most of these traits aren't single gene traits. You're no. describing a, a, a multiplicity of factors, the height and, and, and so on. And part of the challenge, part of the future of genetics is to identify the other determinants, not just management, but genetic that have an influence on it. Because there will be management and genetic things that have an impact. And as we were talking about earlier, 
even though we mentioned this was studied in thoroughbreds, there is a lot of thoroughbred today being used for other disciplines. So someone that's you know, out that has a barrel racer that's either all or part thoroughbred or a racing quarter horse that's majority thoroughbred or a three-day eventing horse that has thoroughbred. I mean, these are things for them to keep in mind when they're looking at performance issues. Absolutely, especially with the thoroughbred, who's a very influential um, breed, breed, Arabian horse as well. And um, But it's not always the same situation in every breed. And so something from a clinical standpoint, from the veterinarian standpoint, they might see a disease in a, in a specific breed of horse, um, in two, two horses that are of two different breeds, and it can have a very similar clinical presentation, but because their genetic background is different, those two horses may need to be managed differently. Uh, certainly the thoroughbred foal might have this particular risk allele, which we know is strongly associated with height. Uh, in a follow-up study in the Belgian horse, which I think just came out, actually, I don't know, I'd have to go check my own CV real quick, but in the follow-up study in the Belgian horse, all the Belgian horses already have this risk allele. They're fixed for it because it confers so much additional height and they were selected to be tall so early on in breed formation. So in the case of the Belgian horse, there are other risk factors, one of which happens to be whether they're a gelding or male or female, and then some other regions of the genome that contain different sets of genes, some of which have an inflammatory role. And so you may not have the same level of success trying to reduce things like OCD and roaring by altering growth curves in the Belgian horse as you would have in the thoroughbred. And so something clinically that you might be prone to, as a as a clinician, you might tend to attack, to attack using the very same strategies. Um, you might have to rethink that based on the genetic background and the and the differing etiology between those those very diverse types of horse that we have. I, I haven't seen that paper, but but what you're describing is a, a great a great opportunity because if, if this gene is associated with uh, with uh, roaring and thoroughbreds and in Belgians it's fixed and there's something else that's there, then it, it allows us perhaps to do a study where we identify the genetic risk factors in Belgians and then just say what happens when you overlay this on the thoroughbreds. Again, these things are, are multi-genic potentially. They and the, are. And, and the diversity of the breeds gives us the, a great opportunity to investigate them. It does. And actually, that was the logic behind going after the Belgians in that second study. It's, it's not that the Belgian draft horse is this huge economic powerhouse where they're going to want to select against it, but it gave us an opportunity to better understand the pathophysiology of the disease. And, and so what we're really hoping is, is we better understand the locus in the Belgian horse if we can identify a specific inflammatory pathway or a developmental pathway. That may give us additional ideas in terms of treatments and interventions that while aren't necessarily the same uh, uh, genetic cause in the thoroughbred, those treatments might actually prove useful. They can certainly be informative if we take them back to the thoroughbred and, and use that, what we've learned in the Belgian horse in their specific genetic situation to propose environmental management and chemotherapeutic changes that may ultimately prove to be useful in another breed. So let's talk about something that, while the tests and the research have been around for a while, is very new to me. It's fragile fold syndrome. What does this mean, and, and what do we know about it? So fragile fold syndrome is, it, just as you mentioned, that the, the research that discovered the particular variant associated with that disease has been out for almost a decade now. Um, we've known about it for a very long time. Uh, but it only recently has come into sort of public view as it has been uh, mentioned in, in social media and online uh, media platforms and, and is uh, beginning to gain awareness, uh, public awareness, in the sport horse market. Um, so it was originally called warm blood fragile foal because it was noted uh, in the, the paper that discovered the variant that that original work, it was done in warm blood breeds. And so the warm blood name got tagged to it, but uh, what we've seen from preliminary studies that we hope will be published soon is that that may not hold true. It's probably in many breeds other than warm bloods. We just need to do some additional work and get those, those numbers published. And so certainly it's not something that only sport horse breeders should be concerned about at this point. 
Now, the, the fragile foal is a, a very tragic condition where the foals who are born who have two copies are prone to these catastrophic skin lesions. And from that regard, it's very heartbreaking um, to the mare owner uh, because they then have a critically ill foal who is destined for, for euthanasia, cannot be saved. They, they have invested a, a year of caring for their mare to get this foal on the ground. They've carefully chosen their stallion. They've paid um, large stud fees. And, um, and then it, it has a, 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 a question of the ethics of, of having one of these foals who's going to have a very painful and short existence. So it's certainly something we need to be very concerned about. Now, unfortunately, with Fragile Foal, as I mentioned, you know, although the original paper came out many years ago, we have not been able to find sufficient funding and investment to study the, the disease further, which is really, really uh, unfortunate because we don't necessarily understand what populations this allele is found in, at what frequencies, and we don't at all understand what implications it may have for a horse who's a carrier. So the scientific name for fragile foal is more appropriately something called Ehrler-Danlos. That is the name of, of two scientists who originally discovered uh, a whole set of syndromes that fit this pattern in humans. So many humans have this same um, disease. And in the case of people, their skin is very fragile, although they tend to survive better with it in most cases. They also have joints that are very lax, what we call, call hypermobile. Um, that can lead to uh, a diverse set of injuries and discomfort in the joints. They may also have problems with their spine. They can have problems with their, their heart valves. They can have problems with the corneas in their eyes. And so we've learned from people with this disease or the set of, of syndromes that there's a whole lot more to it other than the very catastrophic and horrific injuries to the skin that the mare owner may see when their foal hits the ground. Now I think once we gain better understanding of the frequency of this particular variant in the sport horse, we again have to raise a question of why has this been around for so long and hasn't uh, been maladaptive? And there may be a couple of explanations. So certainly we've learned from something called HERDA in the quarter horse, which is which is another ehlers danlos exactly disease, that's a different right. different gene, but the same same clinical presentation. That's similar. right. Similar, similar, similar. Comes yeah. on a little later in life, yeah. um, but our our some of our colleagues at Mississippi State studied the tendons from these horses and discovered that they have very different e elasticity even in heterozygotes, and they proposed that it may actually be an advantage. Uh, for a, a cutting horse, the ability to turn on slightly more elastic tendons that might be uh, might make those horses less likely to to be injured when cutting. And for a sport horse who's doing jumping or dressage, you know maybe it's changing the the biomechanical properties of the tendons um, so that there's a reason why we find this allele in elite horses. And in the same breath, we know from humans that they can have problems with things like heart valves and and their spine. And so, you know, that heterozygous horse that we've assumed is perfectly healthy might be more prone to heart problems or uh, potentially things like sway back or back soreness um, if we examined them in broader studies. We just we just don't know. Or, or they might be athletically superior or for they, some reason, and that's why the, exactly. the gene exists. Exactly. They yes. could be athletically superior. And so I think what we try to tell horse owners when they ask about what they call fragile foal, which really should be called Erler Danlos in the horse, is that um, we need more research and that there's no reason to panic. Um, and that I wish horse owners had been better educated 10 years ago when this first came out. And so I think people were kind of blindsided by this condition and we were like, well, it's been around, it's been a thing for ages. This has always been there. This is not something that's new. It shouldn't have been a surprise to our horse breeders. You know, they, they, they're always concerned about get, making sure the newest vaccine for herpes virus, they're concerned about, you know, abortion storms and things like that. They should have had the same level of awareness and concern for this, this type of um, condition, but because of the difficulty in getting that information out there, they just weren't. But we do need additional research. We need to do more studies so that we can better understand how this impacts heterozygotes, what the allele frequencies are, and then we can, as scientists, make informed recommendations about, yes, you know, you really should select against this because those horses are going to be more likely to have problems X, Y, and Z, or B, no, you need to keep it in the heterozygous state. Let's just work as a registry to uh, eliminate or reduce the possibility of having homozygotes occur.
And I'm going to switch gears just a little bit because I think um, our veterinarians in the field are always dealing with infectious diseases. And I'm not sure they think about how the genetics fits in to these infectious diseases. So, Dr. Bailey, would you walk us through that a little bit? Well, I think infectious diseases are probably one of the strongest uh, elements for molding the genome in an individual. I mean, over the uh, thousands of years, uh, diseases have, have appeared, uh, affected what, what horses will survive, horses with particular genes will survive, and horses with other genes won't. Um, we completed a study recently with uh, Udini Balasuri, who's a virologist looking at equine arteritis virus, and he had a student who was trying to determine what cells were infected by the virus. And in the process of doing that, Yun Young Go, in the process of doing that, she determined that in some horses, uh, a particular set of T cells were infected, in another set of horses they weren't. And she came and she says, well, I think this is genetic. I can't, I can't find any other determinants for it. And we said, probably not, but we can do the test. So we went through and did the test, and to our, our surprise, it was clearly genetic. Um, there was a region on, on chromosome 18 that was associated with it, and uh, Udani got a uh, grant from the uh, USDA to, to further investigate it, and we identified that there was a gene, um, it's a scavenger protein, we don't know much about it, but in this particular case, uh, we determined that it serves as a receptor for the virus. There is a, muta there is a variant on the, the, this protein that uh, the, the virus takes advantage of, it can bind to it and gain entry to the cells. And horses that had this particular variant could get, their cells could become infected and horses that didn't have it wouldn't. Didn't explain entirely whether horses became infected or not because there were other receptors, but here was a genetic variant that had an impact on the course of the disease. The severity and it actually it seems to have an impact on whether stallions become carriers because stallions can become carriers and shed it in their semen. So we have a genetic test now for that where we can give a prediction as to whether a stallion is prone to being a shedder or not, not, not necessarily to other aspects of the disease. And there's other um, West Nile virus. Uh, there's a, a group in Texas that identified um, following some work in, in, uh, in uh, humans, they identified that there was a gene associated with the outcomes of infection with West Nile virus. Um, there's people that are asking questions like when you have an epidemic that hits a, a, a field, Rhodococcus equi, for example, that is one that there isn't a solution for, but why do some, all foals are exposed to Rhodococcus equi, but only some of them become ill? And so there's a number of laboratories that are investigating, trying to find out what is the basis for this. Well, that's really interesting, and I'm learning more and more as we, as we talk today. Um, we mentioned, mentioned foals several times today. I mean, why are reproduction vets, vets who deal with, with horse owners who, you know, breed horses, why are they so important as front lines for genetics? Well, our, you know, our reproductive vets, their stock and trade is in the traffic of DNA. They may not realize it, but that, that's what they do on a day-to-day -day basis is they move, they help horse owners move DNA from point A to point B and get that foal on the ground. And um, our reproductive veterinarians, they're very much at the front line. They're communicating with those horse owners on a daily basis. And um, they can be an enormous help to us uh, simply by talking to horse owners and mentioning, oh, you know, I see so-and-so is ovulating tomorrow. I'll swing by to, to go ahead and, and uh, do that AI. Make sure you go ahead and order that frozen semen. And by the way, um, did you manage to, to, to think to test your mare for disease X, Y, and Z just in case? Um, you know, they have the opportunity to interact with horse owners on a regular basis and I think they could really, really um, play a very important mentorship role in encouraging horse owners to think about, about genetics and about ways they can improve the management of their current herd and the health of their future full crop by incorporating more of our genetics tools into their their day-to-day -to -day, uh, toolbox. Well, now that we've gotten veterinarians in the field excited about trying to learn more about genetics, it's not something that maybe they've even had a course in since undergrad days. 
So it's, it's a, maybe a little difficult to find the right uh, resource or person to help. I know that there is a workshop every other year somewhere in the world uh, for veterinarians who are interested. You can go to horsegenomeworkshop.com. That's horsegenomeworkshop.com. And you can see some of the top equine geneticists in the world and you know get in touch with someone who may have an interest in something that you're curious about but how else can veterinarians uh, get in touch with someone who can answer some of these questions about genetics well i would i would just make another plug about that workshop it has a listing and a description of the different activities um, it may a bit be a bit hairier for hairy for the practicing veterinarian it, it's something that we put up so that people are interested but the key there really is that there's a section there called Meet the Scientists, and that identifies all the scientists worldwide that have been participating in the workshop and are arguably not all of the experts, but a subset of experts. And so there's contact information there. Um, they're probably at an institution near you, and you can call them and talk to them and see if you want to, to, you know, to learn information, or they may be able to direct you to the person who's expert in that. Well, that's great, and I know I, I have a, a great interest in equine genetics and genomics, and, and we could go on and talk for a while, but I think we're going to wrap it up for today, and maybe we can come back and, and visit in the future on some other topics. But for today, thank you, Drs. Bailey and Brooks, for joining us on Equimanagement's Disease Du Jour, and thank you to our listeners for joining us on this podcast. You can hear previous and future podcasts of Disease Du Jour on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. We hope you will join us in the future for another episode of Disease Du Jour.